All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar with our faculty director, David Rogers. My name is Matthew Monigal. I'm the CRM web manager here at Columbia Business School Executive Education. And if this is your first webinar with us, welcome. A few housekeeping notes. We will be collecting questions throughout the webinar. You can use the little Q&A button at the corner center of your screen, and you can ask your questions as they come to mind. We'll be tracking them, uh, and at the very end, we'll have a few minutes there for Q&A. If you are worried, if you have to drop out or if you can't stay for the full half an hour, we will be emailing everyone in the room and anyone who signed up uh, for a, a direct link with the full webinar recording. So a full recording of this with video of the slides will be available after the fact. So don't worry if you miss a thing or if, if something, uh, if you didn't quite catch something, you'll be able to play it back in real time later on. So it's my privilege today to introduce our guest, David Rogers. David is the faculty director of digital marketing strategy as well as digital business strategy. He's a faculty member at Columbia Business School Executive Education, and he is still in the honeymoon period with his new book, The Digital mm -hmm. Transformation Playbook, which came out just this, uh, just I think a week and a half ago, David. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, just just out on the market, still rolling out, I guess, to some uh, some international markets, but North America, it's available everywhere. So welcome so much. I'm going to turn it over to you. And again, if you have any questions, everyone, please feel free to ask in the Q&A box. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, welcome, everybody, to, to the webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all you guys uh, and gals here on the line. Um, just so we put a little uh, background to the face or the disembodied voice, I'm, I'm coming to you from Columbia University here in the city of New York. Um, I teach, uh, as Matt said, work with Matt at Columbia Business School, a business school here in our executive education division, uh, which gives me a chance to teach programs in digital marketing and, and, and business strategy with working executives from all over the world. I just had a program this week with 25 uh, folks from 25 companies in 16 countries. Um, I also, in addition to teaching, I uh, run a conference uh, that I uh, helped found, that I, I helped run a conference that I founded nine years ago called the Bright Conference. We've been running, me and the team, uh, for the for over these years. Uh, each year we get together in the spring, uh, CMOs, uh, chief marketing officers from top global brands like um, L'Oreal, Pepsi, American Express, uh, along with leading technology companies like Google, IBM, Facebook, uh, as well as media companies like the New York Times and Netflix. And, uh, and tech startups, or new startups of all kinds, actually, from Beauty Counter to Zipcar to MakerBot, uh, founders and entrepreneurs. And it's a chance to, to get together on Columbia's campus and look at how these changing uh, and intersecting worlds of brands and uh, innovation technology are, are continuing to influence each other each year. Um, in addition to that, at Columbia, I get to do uh, research on uh, topics related to how uh, technology is changing business and brands. So I've done research studies on showrooming and the rise of the mobile assistant shopper, on marketing ROI in the era of big data, uh, consumer attitudes towards sharing data, which what drives you or makes you more or less willing to share data with the businesses that you, the companies you do business with. Uh, and I get to write books, uh, as Matt alluded to, uh, my latest, but I get to write books for, for practitioners, for uh, for business folks, uh, hopefully giving them some tools and, and best practices and frameworks that can be useful in, in their own work. Um, so through all of that uh, and through my you know consulting and advising of companies, I get to work with a lot of different businesses in very different kinds of categories and different parts of the world. Um, and so the real focus in my work, um, uh, which I'll be drawing on in this webinar, is, is looking at the common patterns across whether you're looking at pharmaceuticals a technology company or a, a retail business, um, financial services, what are the common strategic challenges and emerging trends uh, that are relevant to each of them and what are the sort of underlying patterns we can see uh, that can help us understand opportunities and, and challenges that we're grappling with uh, in this digital era. Um, so what I want to focus on uh, today is my work and research and some of the best practices I've developed related to understanding the digital consumer. And the framework uh, in my last book that uh, I developed was this paradigm of thinking of, of customers as networks rather than as individuals. And so this idea of a customer as network um, and really trying to understand this behavior, both of individuals, but also more in this context of how customers are now connected to each other 
in a much more dynamic uh, way than they have been in the past. Um, and I really try to, with all the companies I work with, start with this focus on the customer because it's very understandable. And it's very easy when you're looking at the question of sort of what is the impact of digital on our business or on our brand or our products and services in our marketing uh, to get very focused on the technologies. Um, there's a lot of technologies that are changing very rapidly. There's a lot to keep track of. And it's easy to be thinking about, um, you know, what are we doing with Facebook and what does Instagram mean for our business? And, and oh my goodness, we have some uh, customers are now going on Snapchat. Is that something we have to, you know, do we have to be there now? Uh, and so it's easy to get focused on the different <clears throat> technologies uh, and how each of them, you know, interact and connect with each other. But I really find it much more strategically valuable for businesses to start by really focusing on the customers and how all this technological change is changing the way that the customers actually connect to each other and the way that they connect to and relate to businesses and organizations uh, of all kinds. And broadly speaking, you know, one of the ways we can think about this shift is in a shift from uh, a model of markets that would look something like this, you know, the traditional mass market model uh, was really how businesses grew and were built in the 20th century. Um, and it's really a model based on economies of scale. And so the relationship, the role of customers is fairly static. Uh, customers either buy or don't buy. That's really their main role. Um, and they're seen and treated as fairly passive. Uh, the role of the business is to deliver value and to market to them. Uh, and the way that you succeeded was through, as I said, economies of scale. So you would look at customers in aggregate in terms of their behaviors. And you look at those customer behaviors and say, well, what are the products or services that are going to meet the needs of the most people possible? And you find that kind of common denominator and you try to mass produce that product because the more you're producing the same thing, uh, the better the, the efficiency was in the margins. Uh, and then to reach them, to communicate with them, it was about communicating outward to the customer. Uh, and again, you would you'd use economies of scale. So you try to find out what mass media as you know, print and then radio and then television and so forth uh, uh, shape the consumer's lives. How do you figure out which you know, magazines and programs and radio shows and so forth your, your customers and your potential customers were most likely to be listening to, reading, watching. Uh, and you would use those to broadcast out your, your marketing messages to build your brand. Um, so what's fundamentally changing uh, in terms of the nature of markets and our relationship to customers is we're moving from a model that looks like this to a model that looks more like this. You know, a customer network model, all of those customers and potential customers uh, have a much more dynamic role because they now, they don't need you to reach each other. Uh, they have access to so many different platforms through which they can communicate, interact, even create and innovate value themselves. Um, they have a lot of influence uh, in terms of how you are perceived and, and, and your, uh, your, your brand in the marketplace. Now, the company you'll see is still central in this diagram, it's still the biggest uh, circle, and that represents the fact that you are still you know, the primary engine of innovation for your business and products and services. You are still the, I would say, the steward of your brand. You're the one who's most responsible uh, for, for that asset. Um, but you also recognize that it's, it is shaped and taking place in this dynamic uh, environment. And so the role of the company is not only to generate and push out uh, value and innovation and deliver it uh, and to communicate our word, um, uh, its brand essence, if you will, uh, but also to, to listen in, to observe, uh, to connect with this network and see what's going on, to learn from the interactions between customers uh, and even to identify and uh, encourage and connect with some customers who are going to uh, get involved, enable it in some sense, do more than simply buy a product, but actually become a, a champion, an advocate, a marketing evangelist, a source of new ideas, uh, a lot of different kinds of roles that customers can take today. And we can think about the shift also in terms of uh, that traditional marketing model, the marketing funnel, uh, and how we rethink it in this more digital age. Uh, traditionally, of course, we want to move our customers, to, well, we still want to move our customers through a series of psychological stages. We need awareness of our product or our service or our business. We want customers to see some value, potential value in it, to consider it. Uh, we want them to achieve, get to that stage as many as possible, the stage of brand preference, where there's a you know, typically measured as purchase intent. 
in terms of a metric, uh, and things like marketing. Uh, but then, of course, we want to get you from purchase intent to actual purchase. That's the stage of, what, of action, uh, and uh, beyond that, even to loyalty. So, from a first purchase to an ongoing relationship with a customer. And now, we have had traditionally a range of uh, broadcast marketing tools that have been usable uh, and effective to varying degrees at different stages of the funnel. Um, television, for example, has always been seen as a, uh, a powerful tool for driving awareness. And it is, uh, particularly still if you're trying to drive awareness in a very broad audience very quickly. It's a powerful uh, tool. But at the same time, each of these stages of the funnel is now being shaped by new digital consumer behaviors in these customer networks. So customers are using search in particular uh, as a means of discovery. And so search results, both organic search and paid search, are becoming critical tools at that same stage of awareness uh, in a way that wasn't before. When customers are going to the stage of consideration, their behaviors have changed as well. They're very often doing online research, not just for high involvement, long decision time products, but for what would even consider, be considered a impulse purchase uh, in the past. Uh, many customers are actually doing uh, some amount of very quick, particularly now with our mobile devices, uh, online research. And a lot of what we're looking for, and sometimes it's product information, but very often it's also user reviews. And so customers are again being uh, uh, influenced by this network effect where folks they don't know, uh, but have given some you know, very comment and feedback on a, on a product or service or brand are helping them sort of sort out that consideration stage of the funnel. Then when customers are getting to the stage of preference, um, they may actually reach out particularly for a, a more significant decision um, to people they actually know, not just you know folks out there, random people in the uh, in the network who are writing reviews, but people who they're connected with on, for example, their you know their Facebook connections, um, and say, hey, has anybody been to this vacation destination? Any recommendations? We're going there this summer, or I'm thinking of buying this refrigerator, uh, or you know, has anybody uh, driven this car? I'm, I'm considering it for my our next purchase. Uh, very often, consumers are showing that kind of behavior. Uh, when we get to the point of action, you know how that happens is very different now because uh, of the digital channels that are available. A customer may be buying in person or online, or you know simultaneously maybe in the store and browsing uh, online options as well at the same time. Uh, once you become a customer, there are more options for uh, extending and maintaining that relationship in the loyalty stage. You know, it's not just the old uh, plastic, you know, key fob, as we call them, the little piece of plastic on your keychain that you used to swipe when you'd be at the drugstore. Um, social media and lots of other tools, uh, uh, marketing automation, allow companies to maintain a more personalized uh, uh, ongoing connection with, with customers uh, when managed properly. Um, but the biggest change in terms of customer behavior and how it is shaping the marketing funnel in the digital era is that I would argue there's actually one more stage now. So uh, the goal is not simply to get customers aware and then considering your, your value proposition and then preferring your brand and, and taking action, becoming a customer, uh, and then as many of those as possible being a repeat customer. But in addition, businesses now want to get as many as possible of those repeat customers to the stage that I would call advocacy. And these are the customers who actually write those online reviews that others read, who answer each other's uh, questions in the social network when someone says, uh, hey, has anybody bought this refrigerator? Uh, and so what's happening is that they're taking a photo of themselves and their product and posting it on Instagram, et cetera. All these things are happening. And what that does is the advocacy actually goes back, of course, to the top of the funnel, it loops up, and it is influencing those next customers through each of those stages, through consideration, preference, action, even up at the stage of awareness, because both in search engines and in social media, uh, what others are saying about you uh, carries more weight and more visibility than what you as a business are saying about yourself. So if we think about this and we understand this sort of shift and this uh, additional layer of, of influence and interaction at every stage of the marketing funnel that's being driven by these digital consumer behaviors, um, and, and particularly this, this sort of additional, uh, additional goal that's been added at the bottom of the funnel, uh, I think it raises a question uh, for business, which is, you know, what are the products and the services and the experiences that would inspire advocacy 
connection into our customer networks, get people not just even buy the product, but really sort of engage and participate and, and maybe talk about it or answer others' questions, et cetera. Uh, and so my research has looked into this question uh, and what I found in looking at hundreds of cases across many different industries and across about 15 years of the you know, sort of public web and internet um, was that they're really looking at many different cases of products and services and um, uh, digital tools, digital marketing campaigns even, uh, looking at the ones that actually were adopted, that really caught on fire, that, that received a lot of uh, response from consumers. Uh, what did they have in common? What I found that there were really five core behaviors of consumers in their digital lives that seem to drive what these product services and experiences are that we are really drawn to. So the first behavior is that customer networks are drawn to greater access. Anything that makes what I want easier, simpler, more accessible, one click away, uh, is always very attractive and always a key driver of, of consumer behavior. So we can look back back in time to, for example, the arrival of the BlackBerry uh, and what an impact that had because all of a sudden uh, business people could access their email, not just at their desk, not just in their office, but anywhere. It was much more accessible. You know, more recently, we can think of something like uh, Uber, uh, where the, the key value is really is just making that uh, car service or that, that driver uh, more accessible, more just one step away. It's so easy, you just you know tap on your phone and it's, and it's right there. Now, the second behavior is I've observed is that customers seek to engage with digital content, content of all kinds. Uh, content has always been a really big driver uh, of the growth of, of the web and of apps uh, and of all of our major digital platforms. Uh, and it's something that, that customer, and this may be entertainment content, it may be business content. Uh, content has always been at the heart of, of digital change, even though in some cases the, the content companies, the publishers may have, uh, you know, more trouble monetizing it in some cases, looking for example, a shift in the music industry, although they're still captured a lot of the value that is still left on the table. Um, but the, the desire there is very, very influential on consumers. So our third behavior is that customers aren't all looking for the same content. Right? We don't all want to watch the same three television shows anymore. Uh, we, we, we are drawn to a world of choice because we've been trained on it. The World Wide Web has a, has a trillion, uh, over a trillion web pages on it. Uh, and, you know, I grew up with a few channels of television. My son, uh, he, for him, television is simply a small subset of YouTube. Uh, there, are, there are millions of channels, so to speak. Uh, and this is something that customers are very drawn to, the ability of digital experiences to give us more choice, more personalization, more ability to find that particular uh, experience or content or thing. Uh, the fourth behavior is, not surprisingly, that consumers seek to connect with each other uh, in their digital lives. We are social animals. Uh, and all kinds of digital experiences, from mobile devices to social networks like Facebook and all social media, in, uh, in fact, um, have really thrived because of uh, they enable this behavior of wanting to connect with the other people who we know and just share where we are, what we're thinking, what we're seeing, our, our experience, our opinions, et cetera. In some cases, though, uh, customers want to do more than just express themselves and connect and say, hey, here's where I am, what I'm doing. They actually want to collaborate with others. Uh, and that's the fifth behavior. They actually work together with other people towards some sense of a shared goal, a project, some kind of collective outcome, uh, working together with others who you may never meet in person. It may be all mediated through uh, through digital technologies. And those, that's the fifth behavior. So uh, the, the, what I want to talk about a little bit in the remainder is just uh, show a case of each of these and how businesses can think about using this understanding of digital behaviors as a way of generating uh, customer strategies. Uh, so if we think about the desire for access, a lot of uh, interesting innovation right now is thinking about how do we how do we make our services and goods and services more on demand, more one click away? Uh, and also even how do we merge these different sort of channels, the retail channel, the online and the, and the, and the offline? Um, uh, because what we're finding is uh, early on, there was this idea of multi-channel. You would do one or the other. 
online or in a store. Uh, and now we're finding that consumers, particularly as they become very adept at using mobile devices, don't make a distinction and that you're living in both at the same time. And so an omni-channel strategy is how do you think about all these different touch points and understanding they're all touching the same customer uh, and really just being there so whatever the context is, whichever is the, is the right solution for them in that moment, you are there and you're providing it. So Walmart, for example, has gone so far as they already had a, an app, a uh, mobile app, but they realized that people who are using that mobile app at home, sitting on the sofa, were asking different questions of it, were looking for different information than a customer who was using it while they were in a physical Walmart store. Uh, just different features. You were using different things. You were maybe looking up to say, well, I'm looking at this product, but I wonder if they have it in another color, or another size, you know, online, et cetera. So they created a different version of the app uh, and they used uh, uh, geofencing so that if you open up the app when you're in the store, it actually recognizes that and says, would you like the in-store version of this app? And then it pulls up different features and so forth. Uh, and they've been successful enough in this integrating uh, uh, of the omni-channel view that Walmart has actually reported their 12% of all their online sales, 12% of all sales on walmart.com are being sold to customers while they're standing in the physical store. So they're, they're clearly really starting to get a sense of, of how the customer is, is kind of moving back and forth between these worlds. Um, the second uh, behavior was, was to engage with content. And for, for businesses, for brands, this is really leading to a shift in brands thinking themselves not so much or not solely as, as advertisers. Uh, you know, how do I create a, a convincing message and then pay to put it in front of people? Uh, but as media companies, how do I, even though I'm a brand or a business, how do I actually create content that is going to be engaging and compelling on its own? And, and customers are going to seek it out and watch it, download it, possibly even share it and spread it around to others. Uh, and so we've seen some interesting companies really uh, investing in this approach. GE is one of them. Uh, actually, a lot of B2B companies have found uh, this is becoming a really important way that you, you cultivate and develop uh, leads and generate leads and, and, and build relationships early on uh, in the sort of uh, and discovery and, and early top of the funnel with, with potential customers is through creating really relevant, compelling content that answers their business questions, is informative. Um, and draws them into understanding more about what your value is and how you work with, with businesses. Uh, GE has done a variety of things. I was talking to their chief creative officer recently, and he talked about their recent content that's been really focused on repositioning themselves and really in the eyes of their business partners as this, um, as they call it, a digital industrial company and saying, look, software is going to be in every, is in everything and going to be in everything we make do. Uh, we are going to be the, the, uh, the, the operating system, we hope, of the sort of industrial big machines of the world, jet engines, turbines, MRI scanners, and, and hospitals, and so forth. Um, and that is that is starting to shift the opinion uh, of both the companies they're doing business with. Also, it's really making a difference in their attracting the right talent. Uh, one of these campaigns launched in the Big Splash uh, with showing one of the videos on, on during the Grammys. They had an eightfold increase in developers, young programmers, uh, submitting resumes saying, oh, this is, okay, this is a company that really has a digital focus I would, I would consider working there. Um, the third strategy, customers are looking for more customized, more personal experience. Uh, so businesses can think about that sometimes in terms of customizing, in some cases, your services, your media, your, uh, some cases, your packaging, even products. Um, but where a lot of this can happen uh, uh, very successfully right now is in communications and uh, really delivering the right message to the right customer, uh, ideally even in sort of the right moment and context. Uh, so a lot is happening with how companies think about how do I target and understand different segments based on their behaviors, not on their traditional sort of demographic segments, but really on an individual basis with these sort of continuously updated micro segmentation. Uh, and just try to make sure that the offers and the communication and the products uh, that I'm that I'm reaching out to them, that I'm, that I'm communicating with them, is relevant to them. And, and companies are seeing a huge lift in conversion and response and engagement uh, when they're able to apply this kind of approach. Uh, a fourth behavior I said was that customers want to connect with each other, uh, and we're using a lot of social media to do it. Uh, and certainly, businesses are, are are taking advantage of this. Uh, in some cases, it's 
I've taught some great cases of companies uh, who use uh, social media and social conversations with customers simply as a source of, of insight, listening in and understanding their market or even their own brand and their customers' uh, uh, unmet needs. Also, is uh, uh, an opportunity for customer service that can take place within this realm. Uh, and in other cases like, like this one, the Ford Fiesta launch, uh, for, uh, for driving the sort of key influencers to create this is a, a very uh, successful uh, campaign where during, before the car actually launched, during the pre-sale period, there's a run-up period where you traditionally always have a pre-marketing spin for the car to simply create awareness in the target audience. In this case, it was a target audience of millennial drivers. Uh, and rather than spending on traditional media in this period before the car arrived on the lots, they actually focused uh, entirely on building this movement, as they call it very effectively, of a uh, of 100 key influencers uh, who are all young people connected in different uh, social circles who are being driven to, uh, who are <laughs> given free cars for six months. Uh, and then this community was instigated. It was all at their own discretion, but it was designed in a way that really sort of engaged them and got them uh, having different experiences every week with the car uh, and just sharing personally and connecting with others in a fun, organic way that really did succeed in creating um, a high level is 38%, I believe, brand awareness among the target segment before the car launched without any traditional uh, marketing. So it, it meet, met their marketing goals uh, for that pre-launch period, actually at a, at a significantly reduced budget versus a traditional paid marketing spend. Uh, the last behavior I mentioned was to collaborate. And we've seen, of course, digital collaborations of things like Wikipedia uh, built by volunteers from all over the world. Uh, we've seen some great apps, things like Waze, the navigation uh, system that actually started with a completely blank map of the world <laughs> and purely by the, the, the usage of customers who turn it on and drive it. And, and uh, in an automated fashion, it tracks where you're going and how fast, but you also can optionally give feedback. Uh, has built a very powerful uh, uh, navigation tool, best in class, if you uh, it, This can be tricky with a for-profit business. Um, you don't want people to feel that you're somehow sort of taking advantage of them, but I've seen some great examples where companies have really fostered a collaboration between and among their customers. One of them is Intuit, uh, where they invited in, they didn't require it, but they invited customers on one of their platforms for their uh, one of their uh, small business uh, uh, tax uh, uh, products to answer each other's questions. Um, Intuit said, well, we'll we, ha we have a robust customer service team, but if if you see a question here that you think you've got a good uh, answer, because a lot of the questions were sort of a mix of uh, software questions, but also tax law. And they said, look, if you if you have some insight, feel free to chime in. You can answer each other's questions. And it really led and over time cultivated this very dynamic community where all these small business owners and a lot of accountants who were you know, interested in networking and meeting them were really helping solving each other's problems. It greatly reduced the customer service costs for the company to it and really also built a, a very thriving community among their customers. So five behaviors, each one can be a source of, of customer strategy. Um, you know, people do ask the sort of obvious question is, all right, where do I start? How do I pick between these? Um, and uh, basically it, 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 the thing I would say is the first thing you don't wanna do is start the, the decision-making process from thinking about technologies. A common mistake where you start the, the planning from saying, well, all right, what's our YouTube strategy this year? What are we doing on Facebook? Do we have a Twitter strategy? And this is not how you uh, you take advantage of this. This is not how you want, want to develop a strategic plan for your business. Um, and I have a strategic planning process that's laid out uh, in my in my in my uh, book, The Network is Your Customer, but we also teach it in the workshop uh, that's part of my digital marketing strategy uh, program in Columbia, but basically, you know, very high level, it's simply a matter of starting from objectives, uh, getting real clarity around the actual objectives you're trying to achieve, moving through uh, deep understanding customers and segmentation, and your brand, its position, what is the value of your brand to, to those key segments, uh, what, is, uh, what is drawing them to you, uh, and then with that in mind, uh, in the context of the specific objectives and the, and the customer segments, identifying uh, one or more of these broad customer strategies, access, engage, customize, connect, collaborate, um, and then using that in the ideation process uh, and then a selection among the ideas you ideate, moving from that to planning for execution and finally putting in place metrics uh, so that you're ready to measure right out the gate 
uh, and iterate and optimize uh, your, your strategy as you carry it forward. Um, and just last point, uh, the importance really is, as I said, the most important thing of this process is to, to remember it has to start with the objectives. That's the most important uh, uh, of any strategic planning. And to be aware, as we've seen some cases here, we're very different from cross-channel sales to sales to market entry to customer service, very different kinds of, uh, uh, of business and marketing goals uh, that may be supported by a digitally focused uh, strategy, a customer strategy based on understanding customers' digital behaviors. So if you know where you're going first, it's much easier to find a strategy that might get you there. Um, all right, I know we're, we're right at two o'clock and we're supposed to wrap up at two, but I've got a few more minutes. So uh, if Matt's got a, a question or two from the audience, we could tackle some here and as well, I'll try to uh, type up response if we've got some to go out uh, after the fact. So thank you so much, David. Um, I know, yeah, I know we have a, a kind of a hard stop at, at two o'clock today. Um, but like David said, I would offer that if you have questions, you know, if you don't feel like we're not going to get to them, David is graciously offered to answer one or two of them. When you get that email from us that lets you know where the webinar is located on our website, where you can get the full recording, it'll include, um, uh, we'll include a couple of answers to some of the questions that, that you asked. So we should have all of that available for you. Um, I think, unfortunately, that's just all the time we have today. But David, I see your contact information there. Good social media places to follow you too. Are you on all in all the usual, uh, all the usual platforms? It's, uh, uh, David underscore Rogers is where you can find me on uh, on Twitter, and you can find me on LinkedIn. Just if you search on David Rogers Columbia, I'll, I'll Google David Rogers Columbia, you can find it pretty easily. And actually, the social links are all on the website as well. So. Perfect. So visit David's website and you'll be able to, to go wherever you need to go to follow uh, follow what he has to say. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for attending. And again, uh, early next week, probably Monday or Tuesday of next week, we'll be sending out that email with the full webinar recording. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, you'll be able to pause it. You'll have access to seeing all the slides there as well. So uh, you can spend a little bit more time and pour over that in greater detail. David, thank you so much. We'll hopefully have you back again soon. Terrific. Thanks, Matt. Take care, everyone.